Good morning. My name is David LeBlanc. I'm a professor of politics in the College of Arts and Sciences and a professor of public policy at the Batten School. And here at the Miller Center, I have the privilege of working with our faculty and practitioner fellows. And I get to work on programs like this. Uh, a few years ago, we worked on a project that, that a lot of you know called First Year. And Sid Milkis and I put together a volume that's called Borderline uh, that focuses on immigration and the kinds of immigration challenges that a president would experience in their first year. Uh, the initial chapter, the introductory chapter, is uh, it's actually called Border Wars. Uh, we are going to hear about border wars, uh, but a different kind of border, or well, maybe actually a very similar kind of border wars, but in a lot more detail. And we set this up by asking you to remember back some, gosh, some five years ago, when Donald Trump came down the escalator to launch his campaign in June of 2015. He said, the, P the U.S. has become a dumping ground for everybody else's problems. When Mexico sends its people, they're not sending their best. They're not sending you. They're not sending you. They're sending people who have lots of problems, and they're bringing those problems with them. They're bringing drugs. They're bringing crime. They're rapists. And some, I assume, are good people. President Trump's approach to immigration is one of his least popular policies. American, uh, Americans' approval for his immigration policies tend to be even lower than their general approval or disapproval of his presidency. In a recent tracking poll, about 40% approve of his immigration policy, while 55% disapprove. And these numbers have generally averaged between 35 to 40%, with 55 to 62% disapproving. Yet American attitudes on immigration are, that are even more complex when one gets past their views of the president's policies. Americans generally favor immigration, but are split evenly on whether to increase decrease or maintain the current flow. Roughly a third of Americans feel that the border has been in crisis and, and support the president's declaration of a national emergency at the border. Another third feel that we should be less restrictive on who we allow to enter. And a, a final third think that we have about the right balance. So we're confronted with what I think is the most interesting policy space in American and even in international politics, where there's a seemingly large gap between what constitutes good electoral politics and what constitutes good public policy. To examine these issues, we are delighted to welcome two esteemed New York Times journalists to join us and discuss their newly penned book, Border Wars. Their book meticulously examines this heady political climate, including the players who helped drive the Trump administration's policies. In particular, the book focuses on the administration's controversial policies of separating families at the border, a policy that provoked such a strong public reaction that it was superseded by the migrant protection protocols, also, remain, uh, also known as Remain in Mexico. In possible contravention of U.S. law, the United States no longer lets asylum seekers cross the border. Instead, they must wait in Mexico for their hearing. With this overview, let me introduce our guests. Julie Hirschfield Davis serves as congressional editor and deputy Washington editor at the New York Times. She's covered politics from Washington for over 20 years in a variety of news outlets, including Bloomberg News, the Associated Press, the, ba the Baltimore Sun, and Congressional Quarterly. Uh, Bill Antholis, the director of the Miller Center, uh, wanted me to note that she's from New Jersey, <laughs> and uh, as, is, as is Bill. Michael Shear is a White House correspondent uh, in the Washington Bureau for the New York Times, covering the tumultuous tenu tenure of Donald Trump. Michael has spent decades uh, with the Times, in addition to nearly two decades at the Washington Post. He scru scrupulously and honorably served on the Pulitzer Prize winning team that covered the Virginia Tech shootings in 2007. To guide the discussion with Julie and Michael is David Martin. David is a senior fellow here at the Miller Center and the Warner Booker Distinguished Professor of International Law Emeritus at the university's School of Law. Prior to joining us here at the university, David spent many years in public service in the fields of human rights, homeland security, and immigration. He's a leading scholar in immigration, constitutional law, and international law, and is, and is a phenomenal asset to the Miller Center team. One note before I let David get things rolling is that after the conclusion of this forum, there will be a book signing uh, out in the ante room. If you want to uh, acquire a book or if you have a book that you want to get signed, there'll be an opportunity to have that done. Without further ado, David Martin. Thank you very much. And I want to just add a word of welcome to Michael and Julie. 
Uh, we're very glad to have them here. Uh, I really encourage you to, take, uh, to, to get the book and read it. It's, uh, it's a very effective account, very accessible account of what is going on in internal policy. And it, it reflects not only some of the great difficulties and oddities of what goes on in this administration, but it gives you a sense of what the policy process normally looks like. It gives you a sense of what the departures are. Uh, policy processes that actually involve, in the normal situation, consulting with operational experts, civil servants who've been involved for a while before it, rolling out new policies, and also um, doing legal analysis uh, and paying close attention to that. Now, it's not that always uh, newly elected administrations should cave in to what the operational people tell them is the easiest thing to do, or, nor that you only adopt the, uh, the most conventional legal interpretation. Sometimes there's room for a more ambitious interpretation. But that's the kind of uh, normal uh, background, a uh, kind of thing that I experienced when I've had my various stints in government. And the book is good in, in <coughs> reflecting that and then giving you an idea about these kinds of departures. We're going to hear from them first. Um, to talk about the book, we'll have uh, a little bit of conversation among the three of us after that, and then we'll have some time for questions and answers at the end. So let me turn it over. Michael and Julie, we're very happy to have you here. Thanks. Well, thank you for the introduction, and thank you for having us. Um, we're delighted to be able to come and talk about the book and hear your questions. Um, as you heard, this, this is an issue that has dominated um, this presidency and certainly been one of the foremost elements of Donald Trump's persona on the political stage. And if you'll indulge me because of my job at the Times and the fact that I've been running impeachment coverage for the last five months, um, I wanted to start to sort of situate all of our thinking about um, what we find interesting and compelling about this issue and Donald Trump's role in it by actually talking about impeachment. Because I think there are actually a lot of parallels between the story behind the allegations that we just all saw play out for the last several months and the story that we tell in this book about uh, how Donald Trump has approached immigration and how the government and the people around him have responded. You basically have uh, a very inexperienced and unorthodox president who does not know very much about policy. Uh, and what he does know, he generally thinks uh, very, has a very low opinion of. Um, and you have sort of a, a, a person who's motivated really in, in a lot of ways by personal grievance and by political opportunism, who is trying to figure out ways to impose a very simplistic view of how things should work on a bureaucracy that is not used to that. Uh, and so you have this uh, person who is new to politics, new to policy making, trying to force into the channels of decision making a very unconventional way of doing things. So as we saw with this whole Ukraine saga, you have President Trump who sets out to do certain things that he finds compelling. He wants to build a wall. That's been a huge issue for him on the campaign. He's promised to do it. He wants to make it a reality. He wants to keep people out. Uh, that's also been a promise that he's made as a candidate uh, coming onto the political seizing on that as his brand. We're going to keep people out. We're going to, if they don't belong here, we're going to throw people out. And not really <coughs> sort of reckoning with or having any idea of the complexities of doing that when you're actually the president and you're trying to govern. But he said that, so that's sort of what he is going to try to, to carry through with. And then you have people around him who are confronted with a president who's asking for all of these things that uh, <coughs> are either impractical, in some cases they're moral, in some cases maybe all three. And they have to figure out how to respond to what they're being asked to do. And so that's kind of the context that uh, I think we saw play out in the impeachment uh, realm of a president who's asking for these things. The people around him in many cases knew it was inappropriate for him to ask for these things, but that's what he wanted. He felt that it was important for him politically. He felt like it was important for the country because he uh, had promised that he was going to do certain things. And then you have a pushback from inside the bureaucracy, which in many cases only made him more insistent on getting done what he wanted to get done. So that's kind of the, the way that uh, we think about how Trump came at this issue uh, when, he first, when he was first campaigning and then when he was first in office. Um, 
a lot, some of you may have heard some of what's heard about some of what's in the book uh, because we did a story when it first came out about uh, alligators and snakes. Uh, I don't know how many of you are familiar with that, but we do talk in the book about some of the president's more outlandish ideas about uh, how to fortify the country against what he constantly describes as an onslaught of you know threatening, harmful immigration. And um, you know we we didn't we did not set out to write a book about uh, ideas that never came to fruition. Um, but I do think it, it's worthwhile because it captures some of the clash that, that has gone on between a president who um, has you know, very extreme ideas of how he wants to implement his vision and a bureaucracy that is just, as I said before, not used to operating in that way, and it doesn't operate in that way. So Trump is you know, heavily driven by impulse. He's, um, he's heavily driven by sort of his, political, his instinct for political marketing and he is always trying to sort of feed that into the system in ways to get you know, the most attention, in ways to get the most uh, extreme version of what he, is, uh, what he has in mind. And then this issue, as David said, is incredibly complex, not just politically, but policy-wise. So, so that really is the clash that you see playing out, is you have a president who has a very simplistic message about this issue is very driven by his own impulses and his own desires about what he wants to see happen. And then a policy apparatus that is in, in reality very complex and you can't actually deliver on some of the things he's saying. And one of the reasons I think we think that Trump was so successful at using this issue to kind of fuel his political rise is because of what Dev David was saying. There is a split in this country about immigration. I, I think it's true that you know, Donald Trump's approach has been unpopular, um, but I also think that if you look more deeply at the numbers, um, Americans are very conf conflicted about whether they are, you know, what kind of immigration they support, how much security and enforcement they think is needed, and there's not a great understanding of how the system works, and therefore I think it's very easy to demagogue the issue and for someone to come along and really shape people's view. This is, we saw this with the caravan, um, this influx of Central American migrants uh, coming up uh, to, uh, north toward, toward the border and across the border. That had been happening for years, but Donald Trump took it, seized on it, and really made it you know, something to be feared. And then if you looked at some of the public opinion numbers, people are alarmed. And you know, if you saw some of the pictures at the border, it looked you know, chaotic and horrible. Um, so I mean, I think that's, it's important to keep that in mind as we look at sort of what he did and why he was able to do it. Um, the other thing that we, I think we really try to get at in the book, and I'm gonna read a passage just to kind of situate everyone in, um, uh, w with what, you know, sort of how we framed this entire issue, is you know, the people around the president. You had a few different categories of people. Uh, you have people around him who are very much bought into this agenda, this restrictionist agenda he talked about on the campaign trail. Uh, people like Stephen Miller, people like Jeff Sessions, Steve Bannon uh, for the first six months of the, of the administration. And these people were you know, actively enabling him, wanted to you know, push as hard as they could to get done what the president said he wanted to get done. Um, and they were all in. And, and in many cases, in some cases anyway, certainly in the case of Jeff Sessions and, and Stephen Miller, they were even more uh, to the right, more restrictionist than the president himself was. Uh, he talked a lot about the wall. Uh, we tell this story in the book about um, a moment during the presidential campaign when uh, Numbers USA, a, a big restrictionist group, had given all the presidential, the Republican presidential candidates grades, or all the presidential candidates actually grades, about their immigration policies. And, and Trump got a C minus. And so he sent one of his aides, his campaign aide, Sam Clovis, to Arlington, to, this, to the headquarters of this group, to meet with uh, Roy Beck, who runs it, to say, like, what do we got to do to get our score up? And, and Beck says to him, you know, what we care about is getting the overall number of immigrants in this country down. We want more workforce enforce, work, workplace enforcement. We want um, you know, a totally different uh, priority in visa issuance. We want all of these like, very technical things that, you know, to, to, if you're Donald Trump, they don't sound very sexy. It's not, the same, you know, it's not like build a wall. You're not going to get people you know, chanting E-Verify at a rally. But those are the sorts of things. I don't know, maybe. Those are the sorts of things that they wanted. And, he's, and he looked at, at, at 
Trump's guy and said, you know, here's a list of 10 things that we want. Build a wall isn't on here. Calling Mexicans rapists is not on here. You don't get any credit for that, right? I mean, so his point was, you know, the rhetoric is fine. The rhetoric is, you know, I don't think the rhetoric actually bothered uh, Roy or many of these groups, but what they're much more focused on is the actual cuts to not just illegal immigration, but legal immigration, and they didn't feel like Trump was talking about that enough. And, and Stephen Miller, uh, and certainly Jeff Sessions, I think, at various points have felt like they were missing opportunities to get done some of these things that like true immigration restrictionists have wanted for a long time because there was so much focus on the wall and things like blocking asylum seekers and, and, and the like. Um, so that's one category of people. Then you had the resistors. There were people, and we write about some of them in the book, inside the government who were watching all of these you know, initiatives play out, the travel ban, um, family separation, and sounding the alarm. You know, there were civil rights lawyers inside the Department of Homeland Security mm -hmm. who wrote memos about the, what they knew was coming, what they had been told was not coming, but they knew was under development of this, this policy of, of separating families at the border. And they were saying, no, we can't do this, and they were pushing back. And they had, as we know, know very little success uh, at doing that, but they tried. Um, and then you had this middle category, which I think we find the most fascinating, and I would put probably, uh, probably Kirsten Nielsen uh, in this category of um, what, what we call them, people who are sort of caught in the middle. Kirsten Nielsen was, had been a, uh, the former D Department of Homeland Security Secretary, had been in the Bush administration, she was, you know, sort of a mainstream Republican. She had been, she'd served in government before she kind of knew how this worked. And I think many of the ideas that Trump had, she didn't necessarily agree with. She didn't love the rhetoric. But her mode was, you know, I'm a Republican. I, I can see the value of, of, you know, getting a better control on illegal immigration, of having stronger enforcement, of getting a handle on what it really is a very dysfunctional system, no matter where you come from on the political spectrum. And she was going to try to just put her nose down and see how much of this we could get done while staying within the law, while, you know, keeping all the guardrails on. And, you know, let's just see how far we can take this. But what she found time and time again was the president was unwilling to be constrained by the, th by the sort of considerations that she was bringing to the table. So she would say, yes, yes, we want to deliver on the wall. But like, you know, you can't just like go around and seize people's land. You can't have a, you know, alligator filled trench. And, and, she, would, and she would give practical reasons. Well, it's going to cost too much. That would, you know, we've already done the procurement on this or that. Uh, but Trump just didn't want to hear any of that. And so she got into a place where, you know, if you stay long enough in a job where you're being asked to do these things, uh, even if what you're trying to bring to the table is some practical considerations, some constraints on the process, you're ultimately going to be, to have a lot of skin in the game to the policies, for the policies that actually get rolled out. And that is what happened with her on family separation. She became the face of that policy. By that point, she, you know, she's now defending not just Donald Trump, but herself, and that is how she got to the place of, you know, being the, the foremost spokesman in the, in the United States government for that. She actually, we have, a, we recount the episode in the book where the White House decides at the height of the se family separation crisis in June of uh, 2018 that someone has to go out in front of the cameras and it's going to have to be Kirsten Nielsen. And, and she, there's a lot of her advisors inside the department said, don't do it. You do not want to be the face of this policy. John Kelly, who was the chief of staff at the time, said, you know, stay away. Don't do it. And ultimately, she decided she had to do it because she was the head of the department. And the department was under the gun and under fire for this policy. But by then, it was, it was too late and too far down the pike. So, um, so we talk about that. I, I want to I uh, turn it over to Mike. But I, I just will run through. Um, well, actually, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read a short uh, por portion of the prologue, and then I'm going to turn it over to Mike. Um, so this is, we're just taking you through sort of how Trump came to this, and then how it became this sort of accidental, backwards centerpiece of his, of his administration. Donald John Trump never meant for a giant wall across the entire southwestern border to be the totem of his presidential campaign or the icon of his presidency, and he certainly never thought it would be the omnipresent reminder of his biggest frustrations in the White House. But it became all of those things, and the story of how it did is the story of Trump's assault on immigration. 
conceived of almost by accident out of political expediency and sheer marketing power, the wall perfectly captured the us versus them spirit that animated Trump's candidacy, becoming a symbol of the same working class disaffection and sense of alienation that he had first tapped into by questioning Barack Obama's birthplace. For a politically inexperienced president who was untethered from any particular ideology, the wall was a centering force, an organizing principle for his promises. He would fix what was broken in the country, and what better symbol of America's problems than a deeply dysfunctional immigration system that had become a third rail of politics, too charged for either party to touch. Trump vowed to cut through all of that, a Manhattan developer who would take a figurative hammer and nails to the task. In doing so, he would gleefully raise a middle finger to political correctness and to a Republican establishment that was looking for ways to appeal to Hispanic voters. And while he was at it, Trump would fan the flames of fear and insecurity by promising to wall off the United States from the threats he imagined were just across the threshold, the them who looked and sounded different than us. And um, we go on from there, but I will close by saying and that that paragraph just alluded to it. Um, it struck me yesterday when uh, we saw the impeachment vote, you can, you can tell I have impeachment on the brain. Um, when Mitt Romney was the one person to vote, uh, the one Republican to vote to convict him, um, in many ways I think what we found was that Trump um, was a reaction by the Republican Party to what had come before. Uh, we have a chapter called The Vessel where we talk about this dinner that Steve Miller, Jeff Sessions, and Steve Bannon had at, at Bannon's townhouse on Capitol Hill. Uh, way back before Donald Trump was even, it was in 2013, it was actually the beginning, you know, of beginning of 2013, right after Mitt Romney had lost the presidential election. And they basically talked about this article called uh, the, disappearing, the Disappearance of the White Working. The, the, the Disappearing White Working Class, or something like that. And the, cons the, the article was essentially saying, saying that you know the, the, this autopsy that happened in the Republican Party after the 2012 campaign, where, where the conclusion was that you know, there had not been enough outreach to um, people of color, to Latinos, that the, that the rhetoric on immigration, if you remember Mitt Romney talking about people self-deporting, uh, had been detrimental, that they, they essentially had to you know, broaden their tent if they wanted to be a viable political party, was completely wrong. And what had happened up instead was that Mitt Romney was seen as an elitist and a globalist, and white working class voters rejected him, and that is why, this article argued, Republicans lost the White House. And until they could find a candidate who could speak to that portion of the country, they would be in the wilderness, and, the, and that's where they needed to go. And they talked at this dinner about who could, who could they run? Who could it be? And they even said to Jeff Sessions, who was sitting at the dinner, maybe you could run. And Jeff Sessions did not want any part of that. But, but that was sort of the mindset of these three people who became you know, integral parts of Trump's campaign. And I think you know, in many ways, that sort of was the beginning of you know, th this Trump marrying up with this issue and sort of riding it to where we see it today. So, um, with that, I will turn it over to Mike. <laughs> sure. So, hi, everybody. Um, so, Julie, um, I, I, I want to leave a lot of time for our conversation with David and then for everybody's questions. Julie, our, our thought was that Julie would sort of give you guys the overview and I would sort of tick through uh, just a, real quickly a few of the more substantive issues that we deal with that, you know, the sort of, uh, that Trump uh, focused on during the first two and a half, two years that we sort of cover in the book. There's more that we, I'm not going to talk about. There's, he talked about, he did a lot on refugees, for example. We can talk about that in our questions. He did, we did the travel ban, um, what have you. I want to just sort of tick off <clears throat> a little bit about DACA, a little bit more about the wall, and a little bit more about family separation. And then uh, Julie and I had an interview with the president right at the end of the book writing process that was kind of crazy. And um, <laughs> so we'll talk about that <clears throat> really quickly. On, and, and I'm just, this is real, I'm going to keep this real short. And then if, if you guys want to talk more on any of these subjects, we're happy to. Um, you know, DACA was a, is a big part of the book. Um, you know, it was, the, it was the one area where everybody knew it was under assault. There were, there were forces kind of around the president that were bound and determined, not the least of which was Jeff Sessions, bound and determined to get rid of DACA. Uh, the president actually campaigned on that. Um, but, but it was also the one area where 
Trump had a sort of soft spot for immigrants, the only area that we could ever find that he had sort of a soft spot for the dreamers. And Steve Bannon and Steve Miller uh, worried about that because they were, were determined to, to end this program. Um, what was interesting to us, I think, about it was that when you talk to people as the president entered in, in the beginning of the administration, there were people in both parties, I think, Republican and Democrat, who thought that this might be the wedge, this might be the opening, the dreamer issue, because he was sort of, he had a soft spot for them, that this might be the kind of opening to a bigger deal you know, to some way where you could marry uh, some things that the left wanted on immigration, legalizing the dreamers with some things that they might, you know, in that context be willing to give the right uh, and the restrictionists, and that there could be that, um, we quote um, one person saying, you know, there's a Nixon to China. There were several people actually told us that thought he might be the Nixon to who could go to China. And of course that never was really in the cards. It was never gonna happen. I mean, it was never, going to happen because Donald Trump doesn't think like a regular politician. He doesn't, he doesn't um, uh, uh, kind of weigh the relative importance of things and say, well, I'm willing to trade this for that. Um, he was wedded to the image that he formed. He, you know, the, uh, David talked about the coming down uh, from the escalator. That's the image that he wanted constantly to project is this person who was tough. And I think every time the kind of political system in Washington pushed the parties to the brink of some kind of deal, Donald Trump pulled back. He doesn't admit that he was the one that pull, pulls back. He blames everybody else for, for that. Um, but in the end, I think we came to believe uh, that he was never gonna abandon the tough guy image um, and that, and that c combined that, combining that sentiment on his part with uh, the people around him who were trying desperately to make sure that that never happened um, meant that there was never there was never a realistic chance of a deal on DACA and we can talk more about that um, on the wall I think you know Julie talked about we, we talk a lot about the wall the wall was his obsession I mean it never uh, you know it never didn't become the real symbol and the real thing around which he cared most uh, he would tell Kirsten Nielsen constantly what, it, what he wanted it to look like. He wanted it to have sh uh, sharp, pointy spikes at the top so that if somebody tried to climb over it, they'd be maimed. Uh, he wanted it to be painted black so that they would, it would get hot in the sun and anybody that touched it would get burned. Um, there was the moat and the alligator and all of that. Uh, the, the one thing that I think we, um, uh, you know, that we, sort of one interesting part about the pursuit of the wall and the pursuit of the billions of dollars that he wanted to build the wall was that it underscored how little they understood, they being the Trump administration, the people that he brought in, the, how little they understood about kind of what they were up against in the policy process that David sort of talked about. They had no idea what they were doing. Um, they got better, you know, they were sort of extraordinarily chaotic in the first part of the administration. They sort of learned the ropes a little bit later, but it was, it was always true that these were people who had this, as Julie said, this simplistic idea of what they wanted to do, of what the president wanted to do, but they weren't steeped in the policy either the policy or the politics of a lot of this stuff. And so they made all sorts of mistakes. They stumbled, they had mischaracterizations. And um, one, of the, one of the moments that we talk about in the book is um, January of 2019, right after the, sort of in the, at the height of the shutdown, the government had shut down uh, over, the, over the break. Uh, they're still, the government's still shut down. Over the wall. Over, and it was shut down over the wall, right? That, that, was, that was the big fight in Congress, was whether or not the Congress was gonna give him money for the wall. And Jared Kushner is, is, is sort of deputized by the president, go fix this, go figure out you know, what to do here. Uh, of course, Jared doesn't know anything about immigration. Um, and so he, he goes and has a meeting, like sort of a, a immigration 101 class, we were on a college campus, you know, immigration 100 um, with a bunch of DHS lawyers and folks, um, sits there for a bunch of hours, and then the quote that we quote for him is, um, holy shit, this is complicated. That was <laughs> Jared. Um, so, and then, and then I'll read, I'm just gonna read like one short little passage from, from our book uh, that's, 
that is right around that same period. We say days later, Kushner gathered the negotiating team in his West Wing office and posed a question. If I could get you every bit of money you needed to build a wall across the entire southern border, how much would that reduce illegal immigration? And separately, if we could close all the loopholes that govern how we deal with families, children, and asylum claims, how much would that affect the numbers? McAleenan, Kevin McAleenan, the CBP commissioner, was matter of fact. A wall across the entirety of the southern border would cut illegal immigration about 20%, maybe 25% at the most. If we close those loopholes, we're talking about a decrease of 75 to 80%. Kushner nodded, his jaw tight and his eyes wide. Okay, he said quietly, so we've wasted the last two years. Which was, an, it was a remarkable admission that, of course, the president never accepted, right? Because he continued and continues to this day to push for the wall. But it was a recognition, I think, kind of for at least a momentary recognition by, um, by Kushner that this pursuit of the wall, and Julie mentioned this in her part too, like it just overshadowed everything and it got in the way and it, and it, it became this, this um, um, you know, the sort of central organizing principle around which everything revolved for the president and for all the bureaucrats. Um, and there were lots of folks, lots of restrictionist folks, lots of kind of hardcore right-wing people who wanted to limit immigration inside the government who would roll their eyes every time the wall would come up because they would know it, this is not, you know, this is not even what we want. Um, um, Julie sort of talked about Kirsten Nielsen. I was going to talk a little bit about Kirsten Nielsen and family separation. Um, I will say the one thing we get asked all the time is why did people, why do people stay? You know, why don't they leave when they are constantly, you know, confronting the president and, con and challenging the president? Um, as Julie said, there was a lot of that same questioning around the people, the Ukraine people as well. Why did they stay? Why did Bill Taylor stay? Why did some of those people stay? Um, the, the moment that I think crystallized for us the, the just the, the remarkable nature of these people that are continuing to stay was, uh, for Kirsten Nielsen, was a moment when the president, it's, it's, it, we're nearing the 2018 midterm elections, the president uh, has ordered the troops to the border, um, there's rocks being thrown at the troops, and he makes a public comment that um, if, if they throw rocks at the troops, they should uh, uh, use, they should use, treat it like, treat a, it, rifle. Treat it like a rifle. Right, with the suggestion as in shoot back, as in shoot, back at the, shoot live, live ammunition back at the, at the migrants. And DHS and lawyers in DHS go crazy. They're like scrambling. You, the president has just said on national television that like, you know, the, the, the so milit US military should shoot, basically the assumption is shoot to kill migrants who are, you know, rushing the border and throwing rocks. Um, they, they find the use of force policy which exists at DHS and they fax it or send it to the White House. <coughs> fax. Send it to the White House, uh, say get this in front of the president right away. This, you, he has to, you, he can't do this, can't order the military to do this. And he finally, the, Trump finally backs down. And a few days later, uh, Kirsten Nielsen is in a meeting with Trump and a bunch of other people. And uh, Trump is still going on and on and, and about the, the military. And, he finally says, okay, okay, I get it. We can't, uh, we can't shoot to kill, that's fine. And he looks at Nielsen and says, but, but we can shoot them in the legs to slow them down, right? <laughs> <laughs> to which she says, no, Mr. President, you, know, you can't do that either, that's not legal. Um, but it's, you know, it was yet, and it was like over and over again with her, she, uh, uh, she would say no to him. And ultimately, and we, can, we write a whole chapter, our sort of last chapter of our book is on what we call the purge, which was the, the, the sort of week that ended with, with Trump finally firing Nielsen um, in a rage, essentially, because she wouldn't sort of bow down to his notion of shutting the whole border down. That was the sort of period of time that he wanted to shut the whole border down, and she didn't want to, she resisted doing that. And so ultimately she gets fired, and then a whole other series of, of uh, administration officials at DHS uh, get fired as well. And so we, we can sort of talk about that, but I think Julie's right when, you know, the, the answer to the question of why do these people stay is, I think she and others were constantly thinking they could push the president off of some of the crazier ideas he had. Uh, they, you know, she and others believed the end goal, right? I mean, they sort of agreed with the idea that we should be tougher on immigration, we should reduce the amount of immigration. Uh, and it was always this, this fight, how do you, how do you take this uh, 
uh, president who had these crazy ideas and sort of redirect him towards something that might actually be sort of workable. Uh, final thing, real quickly, is the, is the interview with Trump. We sat down, he, he, we had requested an interview right at the beginning of this process. They, they never got back to us for months and months and months and months, over a year. Finally, our book was sort of due and, and on Sarah Sanders' last day, on a Friday, I think, um, she, they said, okay, come on over. And they gave us, they said we'd have 15 minutes with him in the Oval Office. 15 minutes turned into 35. Um, and, you know, it was, a, it was a kind of a crazy interview. This was a moment when the, all of the... Um, uh, the border patrol stations were sort of overrun, if you remember, and the, there were stories about the, the children, you know, with no toothpaste and no food and no blankets in, you know, in these super crowded border patrol facilities. It was also happened to be the day that that tragic photo came to light of the, of the migrant father with his little daughter, they're both laying face down in the Rio Grande, having tried to come over to the United States. So we go into the Oval Office and He's in a bubble. He's in his own little world where everything is great and his immigration policies are great. He, you know, anything that's wrong was somebody else's fault. He blamed President Obama. He blamed, you know, it wasn't his, even though he was the one that had affirmatively ended DACA, right? Um, it was a Democrat's fault. DACA, the fault that that, that was over. Um, uh, it, was, it was just remarkable. I mean, we were, we, we're trying to get from him, does he take any responsibility for all of this stuff that ha he had wrought in the first two years? And there was no sense of uh, kind of accountability or kind of accepting that. And then, then <laughs> we had this like, crazy moment towards the end where we asked him, okay, Mr. President, but do you think your legacy is going to be that, you, you, we, do you think you'll be remembered as a xenophobic racist president who you know, who uh, wanted to keep people out of the country. I think we expected a different answer. So he, first he said, well, no, I don't think so, no. And then he paused and he said, well, actually, maybe you're right. Maybe it will, I will be remembered more that way. And there was this like long pause, I remember, and, and then he was back to normal. Then he was like, but I don't think so. And I, I don't want, I, I don't want, I want the country to be secure. And I don't think you want, illegal immigrants to come in the country or whatever. But it was, I think when Julie and I walked out of the interview, we both thought that that was an interesting moment. It was sort of the one moment that maybe sort of a, a kind of a brief flirting moment of self-awareness that he kind of understood that this is going to be part of his legacy, that he is going to be remembered, obviously, for a lot of other stuff too. But I think Julie and I, part of the reason we wrote the book was, you know, we do think that um, this is going to be a large part of his legacy. Um, it'll be debated, it'll be, you know, history will look back on it and people will have, you know, different views. Any escaping uh, that, that immigration and what he's done to sort of, uh, I mean, we call it inside Trump's assault on immigration and I don't think they would even challenge that. I think, I think Trump and, his, and Miller and Bannon, I think they, uh, they they view it as an assault on the immigration system and an effort to change, uh, to really sort of reorient the way our country faces the rest of the world and who comes in and who doesn't. Um, and I think that's going to be a big part of his legacy. So. I, I was very interested that you um, gave such detail about the Kushner uh, episode. I, I had that kind of flag okay, when, when, I, when I read No, 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 but I mean, I, because I think that's, that's very revealing. And it, it tells us a lot about why the wall really had no strong backers in Congress, and, and also why um, the Democrats, particularly uh, uh, Durbin and Schumer, were willing to make a deal early on, which you recount in the book, to give lots of money for the wall in return for uh, the Dreamers, uh, legalization for, for the Dreamers. Um, they, you know, I'm sure they thought that was a big waste of money, but it wasn't actually going to do very much. It wasn't going to be all that effective in one way or another in controlling immigration. It satisfies the president, and we can go forward from that. Um, but uh, uh, the, the, I guess it's an example of, of, of the eye, you know, taking the eye off the ball, or maybe that, but that's just never was Trump's thing. And the people around him who thought about that, who thought, well, I really want to do some things, um, didn't, uh, weren't able to persuade him to focus on that kind of really instrumental sort of question. It's marketing.
it's, right. it's, it's, it's his theme and, it, and it's going to continue to be. Um, but I, I would like to, um, to, to ask a, a little bit, well, to go back to the beginning to start about it. There was a, one of the most uh, telling characterizations of some of the very early steps that the Trump administration took in the first two weeks in office, the executive orders. There were several of them, but one in particular that imposed the travel ban on mostly Muslim countries. Uh, and also greatly restricted the refugee program and barred Syrians in the middle of a brutal civil war, barred them all together. Um, ben Wittes of Lawfare wrote about that. It, it, the title contained the words uh, describing that, that overall approach as malevolence tempered by incompetence. <laughs> and um, I, I was wondering if you, if you think that, that was an accurate assessment then, and uh, to what extent does it still fit, specifically have three years of experience uh, reduced the incompetence part of it, or, or changed the, the underlying motivations? Um, that's a good question. Um, I, don't, I don't think it's changed the motivations at all. I, I agree with the characterization because I think that, you know, in many ways this was the attempt, an attempt by the incoming administration to deliver on what Trump had initially described as a Muslim ban during the campaign, but then backed off of that. Um, but this was one of these examples of, well, we said we were going to do this, so now can, how can we figure out a way in executive order speak to do this? Um, and it was very chaotic. We, at, the, at the time, we write about in the book how uh, Steve Bannon was at the White House saying we just have to flood the zone, flood the zone, flood the zone. He wanted to roll out as many restrictive executive orders as possible, in part to generate this kind of outraged response from the left and to sort of show the world. He didn't just campaign on this. Trump is actually willing to do this, and here are the ways that he's gonna do it, and it's a new day, and we've arrived, and everyone has to sort of snap to and, and start recognizing that we, we are trying to, as, as Miller would later describe it to me, turn the battleship around. Like, they wanted to just switch off every single lever they could. So that was very much the, the goal. Um, they had assembled this team, this kind of secret team of officials during the transition, which included some of the um, Republican staffers on Capitol Hill who had been working on these issues for a long time to come up with essentially a menu of options of like how could we, what, 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 what are the, what's the array of things we could do to sort of turn off as quickly as possible the influx of people into this country. And even this group of people who had been working on many of these policies for a long time was surprised in the end when they saw the order when it finally came out that one of them described it to us as they had offered, they had sort of made this menu of options that they thought the president and his advisors were going to choose from. And instead of ordering something off the menu, they ordered the all-you-can-eat buffet, and they just did all of it. And they all knew that that was not going to work. Uh, but the issue was that because there was such suspicion in the White House at that time, early, very early on, even before the president took office, that you know, the bureaucracy and Obama holdovers inside of the government were going to frustrate their goals and sort of tie everything up in what I think people like you would think of as like the normal policy process of actually vetting things for legality and practicality, they viewed as, you know, slow walking stuff that the resistance doesn't like. So they didn't show it to a lot of the people who would have had to see it to be able to make it workable. They didn't even put it through the National Security Council review process at the White House, which an, an order like this would normally have gone through, because they were worried that, you know, deep state, deep, deep state bureaucrats were going to, you know, see something and go crazy. And in fact, they were right. Once it did become um, public, people did, they, they gave them, what was it, 43 minutes? 43 minutes That's to it. review. To the, review, uh, yeah. uh, the NSC lawyers got 43 minutes to look at it and were freaking out when they saw it because they were like, well, what about this and what about green card holders and, you know, you didn't, you know, th we need guidance on these things. And there's a scene in the book that we, where we talk about uh, the, the moment when the Department of Homeland Security finally gets this thing in their hands. And they are gathered at the NAC, which is uh, their headquarters up in northwestern Washington, D.C., in this conference room. And Kevin McAleenan, who was at the time the um, 
CBP commissioner, but would become the acting secretary later on, was um, on by teleconference. And they're going around the room and they're looking at this thing. And they're For the all- the first time. This is the first they've time they've, they've seen it. Seen These it. are all the lawyers, is, the people that are gonna actually implement it. This is, the, this is a week after Trump has been inaugurated. And there've been whispers that this thing is coming out, but no one's, no one's actually seen it. Uh, and they're going around the room and raising their hands and saying, well, what about our green card holders going to be impacted by this? What about travelers who are in the air? What about refugees who have been cleared to, you know, cleared to come? Nobody had any answers. And in the middle of this meeting, McAleenan pops in from his video conference and says, guys, I'm watching CNN and the president just signed this. <laughs> <laughs> While they were still debating it. So, and I, I'll stop talking, but yeah. yes, they got better. Well, they did learn from that experience. And, and I, I would just say, I, I'll just say more generally, I, th I would add one word to the, the, so malevolence, incompetence, and paranoia, right? Mm -hmm. The paranoia is what, what Julie talked about. It infected everything. It made, it made them, so they were, there was a malevolence. They wanted to, to they were anti-immigrant in their sort of goal. They were, they were completely incompetent. They didn't know what they were doing. They had no idea how the levers of, these were all people, almost all people who were kind of on the far fringe of policy making in Congress. They had been in Congress and working on these issues, but not at the table, right? These are the bomb throwers that were constantly trying to like torpedo sort of serious immigration reform efforts. And so they didn't know how, they'd never worked in administrations before, so they were incompetent. But the paranoia was the thing that like really drove them away from all of the all of the things that could have kind of made them more, you know, sort of moderated the ultimate results of whatever it was, whether it was the refugee ban or the, the, the travel ban or, you know, the family, family separation, same kind of thing. Like it didn't ever go through those processes. And I would just say finally, the, of those three elements, two are still there. The paranoia and the, and the malevolence, if you want to call it that, are still there. I think they've gotten better on the incompetence part, right? They've just, you know, partly by putting their, the people, finding people who actually know what they're doing and putting loyalist people in place, and partly just by experience. They know, they, they, out, they now kind of understand which are the offices, which are the kind of parts of the government that they need to, like, make work. And so I think, so, so that piece has gotten a little better. The other two, I think, are still there. That, that's probably bad news for people on the progressive side because I mean, that's why I think, I think, I think right. Ben Wettis called it tempered by right. uh, incompetence. Um, immediately, it was such a chaotic scene. It blew up na uh, nationally, not in a good way, and it, it immediately faced court challenges, which I right. think they expected. But the chaos in the airports and the complete lack of guidance to the people who had to actually deal with somebody coming in and say, oh, you're from this country. Well, yeah, but I'm returning to a 20-year residence with my green card. I was only away for a week. They didn't have any, they had, they had not decided, and that went back and forth for, for a little while longer. It, it alienated the courts, and I think accounted for a lot of the early track record in yeah. the courts, which now seems to be turning around some, in part because the Supreme Court's taken a little more active role in staying some of the injunctions. Yeah. But let me, I, let me move on to something else. A, a key figure, of course, is Stephen Miller. They don't allow him on TV very often. Not anymore. Uh, for good reason. Um, I mean, when he appears, I, I look at that and I think this is, this is someone who has never tasted of the milk of human kindness uh, <laughs> and, and, and doesn't want to dispense it to anybody else, particularly not if they're foreign. Um, but, but actually, the book gives us a bit of a more complex picture. There are times when he seems fairly pragmatic. Um, there are times when he is personally helpful to other people who we may have savaged in a policy debate before the president a, wh a while before. And, and particularly, um, what's, he seemed to be willing to, um, to make a DACA deal if he could get something that was very important to him and not so much to the president, and that was what Numbers USA likes, to reduce the number of spaces for, for legal migrants. But could you tell us, paint a bigger picture of, of Stephen Miller and, and, and his role and his, uh, his influence? Yeah, I mean, I think, I think Stephen Miller's influence in this White House comes from his bond with Trump, which I think comes from, I mean, clearly he, he joined the campaign at an early stage, and so he's been there a while and has been very loyal, and that, that makes a difference. But I also think it comes from something they both share in common, which is their instinct to troll. They are both 
people who are driven by, they like to provoke a response and then react to that response. And you know, we, we write about in the book and some others, other journalists have documented how when he was a high schooler in Santa Monica, California, uh, in a you know, you know, uh, high school that had a, a large Hispanic population, he liked to get up at school assemblies and talk about you know, that we need all, everyone needs to speak English and that you know, multiculturalism is a hoax or is bad and to get a rise out of people. I'm not saying he didn't believe these things, but it was clear to everyone around him at that time that he, a lot of what he said, he said because he enjoyed uh, needling people and challenging convention and being the one who will stand up and say the thing that is rude and no one else wants to say. And that is sort of the essence of Trump. And so I think they were drawn to each other for that reason. Um, I do think he's a little more complicated than people know. I think what, what Mike said is true. A lot of the, you know, certainly Jeff Sessions, who he worked for on the Hill before uh, joining the campaign, um, a lot of the conservative restri immigration restrictionists um, on the Hill and in Washington were relegated for many, many, many years to the sidelines of the immigration debate. And nobody ever really listened to them very much. The, the, the real conversation on immigration was always, you know, the Democrats and the sort of mainstream Republicans who were trying to figure out a way to get together and make a deal. Um, and so Stephen didn't really have much experience actually negotiating anything or making any, you know, policy. So he was in a situation where all he knew what, how to do was this bomb throwing and the provoking of people. And then all of a sudden he has this incredibly powerful perch in the West Wing. And there are a lot of people um, in the Republican Party and the Democratic Party who are saying, listen, this president, f say what you will about him, has a lot of credibility with the public on immigration because of the way he's branded himself, because of the way he ran. He could be the one to make the big deal. If he said it was okay, if he would bless it, everyone would accept it. And so like, let's take this opportunity to try to make something happen. And I do think that at various points, Miller really wanted that to happen. But I think the issue was that he really, uh, he was very much caught up in these, you know, longstanding ideas of reducing the number of immigrants into the country, both illegal and legal. And whereas Trump was talking about the wall and stopping bad guys, the deal that he would want to make, the, the price that he would be willing to pay DACA for was something different than, in the end, what the president really wanted. And we talk about how um, you know, there was this talk about the, the merit-based uh, immigration system, that it has been a goal of you know, Miller and, and the, some of these groups for a very long time. And uh, it wasn't, he, Trump came out and endorsed it. And at this, on the same day that he did, there was an activist at the, in the West Wing who warned them, you know, if you're you know, trying to make a deal on DACA and you're saying that you're willing to sort of trade away something for it and that you're, all you're really focused on is lowering illegal immigration and not legal immigration, how come the president is about to go out and say that he's for this bill that cuts legal immigration essentially in half? And they were like, oh, no, no, that's not right. That's not what this bill does. And in fact, it was what that bill did. And 20 minutes later, the president went into the East Room and endorsed it. And it's not, even to this day, it's not clear to us whether he actually understood that he was endorsing cuts to legal immigration, because that's not the way he talks, and that's not the way he's branded it. But I think you did have this kind of collision behind the scenes of some of the priorities that people like Stephen Miller had and the rhetoric that Trump was using. I, let me ask, I just want to ask one final qu question of my own before we open it up here. Uh, in, the, uh, in the epilogue, uh, you summarize um, by pointing out that immigration uh, has been at the center of so some of Trump's biggest disappointments, um, including, and I quote, futile attempts to stop waves of migrant families from pouring into the country, close quotes. And I'm wondering if, you know, that was, I guess, written last summer when apprehensions along the southwest border reached 144,000 a month. It's now down to 40,000 a month, largely, I think, because uh, the courts let the Remain in Mexico program go into effect. I mean, Kirsten Nielsen ultimately had a huge impact. This, this thing that she fought for that she was 
criticized and abused by Trump for a lot of times trying to make a deal with, with Mexico, um, turns out to have had a lot of the, the, the main impact um, that has lowered the temperature on that particular issue. So would you, would you change that adjective, um, futile um, okay. attempts? Uh, and, 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 I, and, and in the end, I wonder, is that, uh, is that helpful for him? Because you, you go on to point out that he, 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 it's been disappointments, but it's also been fuel, kind right. of things not going right, and blaming Democrats and courts has been a fuel for him. Maybe that's not going to be there anymore. I mean, I think, so I, I, I do think that the, the situation on the ground has changed since, since our book came out. And, I, and Julie and I are going to uh, update the book for the paperback, which we think is coming out oh. September, October, so right before the election. So the way pu book publishing works, of course, we'll, we'll be able to update till about the end of this month. You know, so we, there, yeah. there'll be a lot that will <laughs> probably happen that won't be reflected still in, even in that edition. Um, and I do think that um, uh, what seemed at that moment at that in the summer as, you know, sort of futile efforts have, they, as you say, the Remain in Mexico uh, seems to have worked. The Mexican government has also stepped up their enforcement, their, their own interior enforcement in a way that um, they hadn't before. Now that's partly because they were doing it under duress, threats of massive tariffs that the president, yeah. uh, that the president threatened. So there's, there's been some of that that's changed. Um, some, however, of, you know, some of the, his policies are still, I mean, all of them practically, public charge is another one where they're trying to limit um, uh, immigration by, by um, uh, focusing on, on poor, poor immigrants and, and making it harder for poor people to come in the country because they'd be a drain. The court just let that go into effect as well. But all of those are being let go into effect in temporary ways. So, I mean, I think we, the final story on whether Remain in Mexico ends up sort of, um, you know, staying as a permanent feature of the American immigration system, whether public charge is in there, I think that's all still um, kind of ultimately yet to be determined. I think the administration is pretty confident because the, they, because the court that we have, the Supreme Court that, they, that we have, I think they, they think that in the end they'll probably get most of these things. But I do think um, that, that some of that's going to have to be kind of changed. Okay, thank you. We're ready for questions from the audience. There'll be a microphone, so please uh, wait for that. Uh, yeah, well, well tr take the one back there first, okay? Hi, thank you, for, thank you for being here today. Um, in your conversation so far, you've highlighted several prominent policy issues, such as DACA, refugee resettlement um, today, Public Charge Act. Um, I'd be curious to hear your perspective as journalists on reporting on these issues, um, not just on the issues themselves, but for making um, the complex structures which undergird them just as salient and digestible for a public audience, um, also in terms of um, the misinform age of misinformation today of the process of reporting on these issues. Thanks. Yeah, it's a really good question. It's it's very difficult to report effectively on this issue because um, a it's very complex, and b as I said before, um, President Trump talks about it in very simplistic, often completely misleading ways. Um, this became an issue uh, when the caravan, you know. Uh, came to the fore, I guess you would say, in the end or the, in the middle of 2018. Um, we had, both of us, uh, when we had been covering the Obama White House, covered the same phenomenon, um, this sort of uptick in Central American migration that is in some ways seasonal but had no question intensified uh, in 2014. Uh, and it's, and at the time, I don't think anyone was, there weren't many people who were really uh, using it as a political issue so much as it was a huge uh, challenge. administrative challenge for the Obama administration and they got a lot of flack for the way that they handled it, um, for their m messaging of deterrence and saying, you know, please don't come, don't make this dangerous journey. Um, a lot of the progressive groups that have been the toughest on Trump were incredibly tough on the Obama administration at that time, but it was a, a little bit less challenging to write about it then because, again, there wasn't such a political debate around it. It was more explaining to people, you know, what this phenomenon was, what caused it, uh, 
the, the information we had about why it was uh, intensifying and what steps the administration was taking to sort of get its arms around it. When the same thing happened when Trump was president, he was in the thick of the 2018 midterm congressional campaigns. He was, you know, talking about people being sick and people being dangerous and terrorists could be in there. And it was a whole nother um, realm of um, amplification that we as journalists, you know, you can't not report on it. He's the president, he's saying these things, but it made it all the more important for us to really explain, you know, what this was and what this wasn't. Um, we, we all, you know, in every, in, on every issue, but certainly on immigration, um, we've been, we've tried to do more fact checking, like on a daily basis, where you don't just write a story saying the president said this and here's what's going on, but you also actually have a fact check that says, like, is there any evidence that, you know, the caravan is full of criminals and terrorists and, you know, has statistics about those things. Um, so we try, but I will say it's extremely challenging to do that. I, I, I remember there was an event at the White House. And, you know, was in a way, it, it, was a, it was a tactic to focus attention on, you know, jurisdictions that do not cooperate or do not, you know, automatically give over information to federal immigration authorities, which he calls sanctuary cities. Um, and, and the entire sort of framing of the event was a negative thing. It was all law enforcement talking about how horrible it is to have, you know, those kinds of laws uh, on the books in states around the country and cities around the country. Um, in this event, he, he called uh, undocumented immigrants monster. And he was, of course, talking in the context of people who have been arrested for doing, you know, and are accused of a crime, and then are released after having been accused of a crime and either are awaiting trial or have gotten off, and are not then given over to immigration authorities because they live in a place where that's not done. And so, you know, sort of narrowly speaking, he was talking about illegal, uh, undocumented immigrants who have committed crimes. But it was very clear that, you know, using the word monsters, he wasn't making much of a distinction between, you know, somebody who's committed a crime and is in a gang and just someone who's here without authorization. And I wrote about it and it was a, it was a big deal. We, I mean, we all got a lot of blowback because, you know, his, his allies said what well, was very clear, he was not talking about immigrants writ large, but to anyone who was listening to him he speak, was. It, he was. He wasn't making any distinction. It was like immigrants are monsters, and that's basically the message. So, I guess I would just say it's it's challenging, and you know, we we all try to be as clear as we can when we are talking about the policies and the rhetoric, but it, it's murky. This one right here. I have a huge topic, and you're pr not prepared to address it. So, I'll, I'm interested in. What, what comes to you, um, climate change and human migration? Hmm. Climate change and human, uh, <laughs> I mean, this is not gonna be responsive as much as you'd like. I mean, I think, I think w you know, clearly the migration issues that the United States is dealing with and what Trump has, you know, put his own brand on is part of a much bigger story. We don't, we don't tell a lot of that story in our book because, um, because it's so focused on American, American policy, U.S. policy. Um, but it's clear that some of the same forces that are driving that the backlash of the Trump kind of ideology against a kind of changing demographic in the United States is a similar backlash that's happening in Europe. Um, the migration flows, um, you know, across Europe, which have upended politics in Britain, helped spark the Brexit fight, the, you know, the politics of migration that have helped to uh, undermine Merkel in Germany, um, you know, the hundreds of thousands of millions of, of migrants that sort of flooded out of Syria during the civil war there. I mean, you know, it, we were mindful, uh, we're not international reporters, we don't, we, we haven't traveled the world and seen that issue. Um, we were mindful as we were writing the book that it's a it fits into a broader mosaic of issues. I don't know that I've thought, I don't know that Julie's thought how that interacts with climate change other than, I guess, 
generally, like, you know, where people live and how, how many people there are in different places is obviously, you know, is obviously driven and, and interconnected with kind of our planet and how, and how um, you know, how people can live. Um, but that sort of stumps me a little bit. Agriculture in places like Honduras. Sure, that's a good example. That's actually a good example, right? Like, you know, to the extent that, that to the extent that there's economic crises in a place like Honduras that is then driving people north because because the jobs uh, uh, aren't there and because the standard of life isn't there, then turns out to be a political problem when that those Hondurans come to the border of the United States. Um, you know, one of the things we talk about a little bit in our book is the extent to which. Um, Trump's anti-foreign aid uh, bias, a bias against foreign aid, which obviously played out in the Ukraine situation as well, but in Central America, he for a time shut down almost all of the foreign aid that, that is intended to go to the Central American countries to help with that kind of thing, right? Like if, if that's one of the root causes of the migration that's coming north, how do you help the Honduran economy kind of recover so that, so that you reduce the need for those migration flows? So it's interesting, I, I agree. Yes, right over there. over there, yes. Thank you very much for being here. I'm an immigrant myself. When I came, uh, each country had a quota. The other thing was, so you just went on a waiting list. The other thing was you had to have a sponsor. Now, I don't see the United States going back to the quota system, but I am beginning to see now that this thing of not having a sponsor, but for these immigrants to become or to be self-sufficient. So I see a little bit of a um, move towards that. Any comments? Yeah, I mean, that this is sort of, this was the animating force behind <coughs> the public charge rule. It was this idea that, um, you know, there's th that concept is quite an old one in, in American law, and, it, and it's at various stages, it's been defined in different ways. Trump, um, and Stephen Miller was a big proponent of this, has set out to really tighten uh, the rules and lower the threshold such that, you know, you, let, and the concept is you need to demonstrate an ability to, you know, survive economically on your own uh, if you were to be able to be a legal resident of this country. Um, I think that there is, that's probably one of those issues that David mentioned at the beginning, that the public is, you know, there, there's quite a bit of support. We looked at the, at the public opinion on this, and there, there's, you know, I think broad support in the public for uh, figuring out a way to make sure that immigrants who are admitted to this country, broadly speaking, are able to be successful and, you know, survive and fend for themselves. Um, but I do think that the approach that the Trump administration has taken, not just with the public charge rule, but on some of these other, in some of these other programs, um, is, you know, to do that to the exclusion of sort of the other side of the immigration coin, which is humanitarian, you know, uh, a humanitarian spirit. I mean, uh, they, they have tried to, you know, shut down um, the refugee program, um, in many times arguing that, you know, refugees are a drain on the economy, which there is no evidence of that. Um, but they've used this idea of self-sufficiency, I guess I'm trying to say, as a political tool, um, which is not to say that there isn't room to, you know, integrate that more into the standards that, you know, the system looks at broadly for how to bring people here and how to make sure that they can contribute to society once they're here. Thank you. Kevin, go. Um, I don't think there's a quota across the board. There's a waiting. There's a waiting list, and there are some. There are some categories that you know that are limited, but there's not strict quotas of 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 individual across individual countries, right? Yeah, that's right. There, there are quotas, there but are they're quotas they're 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 like family quotas or business right. related. Right. Categor they don't they don't, they don't say we only quotas. want a very small number from a particular right. country. There's, right. I mean, there are for refugees. And the refugees. I mean, not quotas, refugees. but there are numbers for refugees and other and other programs. But right. broadly speaking, that's right. Kevin, you already talked about the rollout of the travel ban. I'm interested in its development. So one of the main issues in the litigation of the travel ban, Trump v. Hawaii, was the motivation for it. On one hand, you have candidate Trump saying that. You know, 
Islam hates us, and sorts of, all sorts of other Islamophobic comments as a candidate. And then we have Rudy Giuliani saying that, that he was directed to take the, the Muslim ban, make it legal, and so forth. On the other hand, we have the policy itself, which is arguably facially neutral, and in fact borrows a set of countries from a 2015 uh, Obama-era law designed to modify the visa waiver protection, uh, the visa waiver program. So uh, one of the things that courts wrestled with was to what extent do we consider the you know, underlying, perhaps latent animus of the policy developers, whether it's Canada Trump, President Trump, or his advisors, um, in, in determining the, the constitutionality of a policy. Um, and, and this also manifested itself in the second and third iteration. So I wonder if you learned anything in writing the book about kind of the motivation that went into this, especially as the policy was, was modified over time. So I, I would say, um, you know, the, I, I don't think we stumbled upon, we didn't stumble upon any, you know, smoking gun email that said, ha ha, let's, let's uh, screw all Muslims, right, like in that process. Um, what I think was, was, was laid bare kind of in over the course of that first year, um, and our book does a, f does a pretty good job in the first couple of chapters of, of kind of describing this, was the extent to which there was virtually no process. So when the courts, when the courts went, went and looked at it along the way, as you say, they were looking for this question of what was the motivation, and one of the ways that they try to divine that is to say, let's look at the process that you went through to develop. How did you pick the countries? How did you, you know, what was the sort of, was there a deliberative process? By the time they get to the third travel ban, right, towards the end of the year, um, they, the, the lawyers, over the objections, by the way, of the president, who just thought that they should have stuck with the first one, and, and, and as, um, as one of our chapters is titled, you know, I don't want a fucking watered down version, right? That was what the president told his lawyers. But by the, by the time they get to the third one, DHS, the lawyers, Miller, the White House, they all had put in place a process. There was this extensive review where they went country by country. <clears throat> they had a checklist for, you know, how good are the, are the procedures in each country in terms of like, can they screen people before they get on a plane? Do they have information about, you know, their background? Do they have information about a, you know, a person's, you know, contacts with other potential, you know, known to potential suspects and whatever? So that <clears throat> when they went to defend it to the Supreme Court, when they went to defend the third travel ban, they could actually point to a process and say, you know, he, you know, here's why we picked this country, but not that country. Here's the score list that how each country, you know, checked. Here's the process by which a country can actually petition to get off of the travel ban, right? You know, if they're if if a country decides they're going to put in place a whole bunch of new screening measures to make it more secure, so that people can come to the United States with some confidence, then they potentially can get off the travel ban. All of that was completely not existent in the first in the first travel ban, right? Like. And yet, you know, we do t have this anecdote about the third travel ban, which they did do an enormous amount of work to try to get the list together that would be like the countries that they had, you know, cleared now and were fine. And they go to Bedminster, Elaine Duke, I believe mm -hmm. it is, and they show it to Trump and he is, he goes ballistic and says, why is effing Somalia on here? Can't we just bar people from Somalia? So like when you're dealing with, uh, my point being when you're dealing with someone like that. You know, he didn't write down anywhere like what his rationale was for that, but for some reason he did not want to be admitting people from Somalia. And so people told us they thought it was cuz he he had seen the stories about the pirates, the Somali pirates and didn't <laughs> we, were, we were also told it could have been about Ilhan Omar, but yeah, anyways. Yeah, that was that. Too. <laughs> afraid we, we've reached the end of our our time here. Um, uh, please join me in in thanking our speakers. <laughs> And, and, be and before, before you get up, if most people could, could stay in place so that they can go back and, and take their stations at the book signing event, I do encourage all of you to go back there. There are books available, and they'll be happy to, to sign them for you. So if you could wait just a minute, most of you, so that they can disengage from the sound system and uh, get back there. Thank you very much.